Hi there. Welcome to the 12th episode of our Brain Power series. In this series, we've looked at how to improve your brain power. For this session, we're going to look at the power of freedom, real freedom. But let's just do a little bit of recap on who is in charge. We looked at the anatomy of a habit, and we, we spoke about the conscious and the subconscious mind, and the fact that when you make principal decisions, that is a cognitive, frontal lobe, conscious decision, and it is filtered through that part of the brain that should be in control. When I do feelings uh, decisions, um, it, it goes straight to the subconscious mind. It is emotion orientated and it is stored as fact. So we needed to understand the two minds and really who is in, con in, in control of this brain of ours. Now, some brain facts for tonight. The physical stimuli produced by heat, by cold, by pressure, by water and the sun on the body skin have a healing effect on the brain. Wow, this is amazing. So it means that if I get out in the sun and have a little bit of a sunbathe, I'm not talking about tanning, just sunbathing. We need a few minutes of sun every day. I'm actually doing my brain a favor. I need to feel water on my skin, you know, go for a little dip in the swimming pool. And that sensation on the skin actually would uh, be a very therapeutic, uh, have a therapeutic effect on, on our brain as a whole. Now, let's talk about the power of freedom. You see, you could set yourself up for success or for failure. Um, and you, you do this consciously, and you could and you should do this consciously before you uh, actually go into a direction. D.L. Moody has a very interesting little experience to share. One man came to visit him, and he had a whole tale of um, moral decay shared to this, to this famous preacher of how bad things have been in his life. And then he asked uh, Mr. Moody, he said, Mr. Moody, what would you have done if you had gotten in such a situation? And the answer was very clear, and it's very profound. The answer is, man, I would never have gotten into it. Sometimes we set ourselves up for failure by the choices we make beforehand. And sometimes we even make these choices consciously. Now, there's a few principles that we want to share with you in, in this episode. God wants us to be winners. He doesn't want you to be a loser. He wants you to be a winner. That's very important. It's not too late. Sometimes we get to the more mature time of our, our life and we say, well, it's too late to change. You know, I've never done exercise. You know, I cannot, you know, it's too late now. I'm too old to do that. It's not too late. And we want to give you an example. This lady, Hilda Crooks, has really been a role model in my life. Looking at her life and uh, what she's gone through. And let me share her life and her life experience with you. She climbed the 14,000 feet Mount Whitney yearly between the ages of 66 and 88 years old. There's a, a plaque where uh, you could see the group in which one of the groups uh, in which she uh, walked uh, and climbed this, this, uh, this mountain. And there you see her, second in the row, with a red t-shirt on and uh, you know if you if you look at that uh, mostly men uh, ladies don't make it but Hilda Crooks she did it California has named it Crooks Peak because she's been there the most that's amazing uh, at a very very mature age she she got this honor and uh, she was actually handed over a certificate um, because of her achievements. Well, on July 24, 1987, she reached the summit of the 12,388-foot Mount Fuji 
at the age of 91 years old. I don't know what age you are, but just imagine, you know, imagine seeing somebody 91 years old climbing a mountain like Mount Fuji. And uh, she climbed this at 91 years old. This is really profound. She's climbed 97 peaks between her 81st and her 90th birthday. Wow, what a remarkable woman this is. She died in 1997 at the age of 102. But you know what? That's not the whole story. At 60 years old, she was bedridden. She got her physician to come and see her at home. That was the days where they still came out to come and see at home. And she said, Doctor, am I going to die in this bed as an invalid? Is there something we can do? And the doctor said something very profound. I don't know if doctors should say something like that, but in her case, it worked. He said to her, well, it depends on you. She said, what do you mean? I'm here for two years already. He says, if you really want to get out of this bed, you can get out of this bed. And she made a decision. At 60 years old, she made a decision. She said, I don't want to be bedridden. I want to make a change. I want to tell you that the doctors found in 90, at, the, at the age of 94, she had the heart and the lungs of an 18-year-old. She started exercising. You know, we think it's too late. In her case, it's proven it was not too late. I've seen this at our lifestyle centers, the Beefree Lifestyle Center, so many times where people come in and they can hardly walk a few meters. And then after five, six, seven, eight days, they start walking four or five kilometers with us at the same pace. Well, with Hilda, that's really what happened. But you won't, you won't believe this. Hilda Crook still holds the world's record in the 10,000 meters marathon of women over 85 years old. Here she is um, during a, 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 a campaign where they uh, got some money for a school and uh, they got sponsors and she walked on a sponsored route to help to build a school, a Christian school. And uh, when she was asked, Hilda, what is your secret? She would give this very, very simple statement. She said, I believe in a simple diet. Well, I believe in that too. I, a life free of tobacco and alcohol. Yes, I second that. A deep commitment to spiritual values. Amen. And then, a pleasant outlook on life. I'm really working on that one. This is, this is so great. She lived a ripe age of 102 years while she was bedridden when she was 60. The answer is, it's not too late. You can make a change by God's grace. Ask Him to help you. Start getting into a program where you can look after your body and your brain and not just your soul. You know, we do our worships. We do our devotions. That is so necessary. But we need physical activity as well. We need emotional activity. We need social activity as well. Hilda, it was not too late for her to find that joy. I also need to share with you that we need an attitude of integrity. Something really lacking in our society today. We don't have integrity anymore. You know, when we used to take our cars to the mechanics to do some repairs on, you know, we feel comfortable. They know what they're doing. I sense that today I'm a bit hesitant because people have no integrity. They would send your car back with the same problems and would make an excuse why the repairs weren't done. There's no integrity. See, if I really have integrity, I would do all in my might to help my customer to be happy. Well, this is really a big problem. Another pointer I need to give you is it all starts in the mind. Nowhere else. You know, we, we, we have seen that a habit starts in the mind. It is triggered by our senses, but there in my thoughts, in my mind, I start with this process. This whole setting yourself up for success starts in your mind. 
And then there's this issue of deferred satisfaction. And I want us just to abbreviate a little bit on this, on this issue. Deferred satisfaction. You see, we live in a society where it demands instant gratification. I've seen a little girl throwing a tantrum on the floor of one of the supermarkets, and she said, I want it. I want it now. Mommy said, no, there's, there is sweeties at home. We're going to have sweeties. You can't take that sweetie. And I, I really felt for this mother. She, she was so patient. But little girl threw a tantrum there and said, I want it now. You know, we want everything now. We don't want to wait for tomorrow. We don't want to work towards something. We want it now. We want gratification now. And this really leads us up to a part of no success. You see, there is deferred satisfaction with achievements on earth, but also achievements by God's grace getting to heaven. Well, look at this. An athlete. And I want you to consider this competitive athlete. Now, I'm not too competitive. I like cycling. I've cycled many of the Argus routes, you know, uh, uh, cycle routes. The Argus is one of them in Cape Town, South Africa. And uh, I've learned some principles while cycling. Now, one of them is that an athlete will push themselves beyond endurance in order to gain a prize for themselves or for their club or for their country. And they would actually do things that they sometimes even shouldn't to really get there, to really achieve, to really you know, get to the prize. And, well, there's a verse in the Bible that really talks about this. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24 to 27. It says, Do you not know that those running in a race all run, but one receives the prize? So, run that you may obtain that prize. Go for it. Go for it. Verse 25 says, And everyone who strives for the mastery, is temperate in all things. Then, those truly that they may receive a corruptible crown. But we, as Christians, we are uncorruptible crown. Now, let's just grasp the, the content of this. Everyone strives for mastery, is temperate, in all the things so that they could be fit to get this and get this done. But only those truly that they may receive a corruptible crown. We do this for a, a little plaque or a little symbol or a little certificate saying we've done this. A little medal, we've done it. A little crown, you've done it. It's, it's a corruptible thing. But then... Paul says, we as Christians, we do it, you know, because we do it for an uncorruptible crown. Verse 26 says, so then I run, not as if I were uncertain. You see, when I'm practicing to get that prize, I am not uncertain about it. I run to get to the end. And so I fight, not as one who beats the air, you know, beating nothing. I do it for a purpose. And then we go to the last verse, but I buffet my body. So I really, I I don't want to say punish, but I really I punish myself. I, I really have to control myself, discipline myself, and lead it captive. Less proclaiming to others myself might be rejected. So I, I, I want to get that prize, and I, I keep myself disciplined. I work towards it. I keep myself captive. I don't eat the things, and that's what athletes do. They don't eat this. They don't do that because that would hinder their performance. Now, when we talk about deferred satisfaction, it means I'm going through this groaning and grasping that goes on as I train, and I do, don't do this for pleasure. I do it because I want the crown. I want to endure to the end. I want the... the, the, the the medal at the end of the day. They're willing to ensure suffering now in order to win in the future. You know, life is like that. If I really want to have success, 
I would actually allow myself some discomfort, some, yeah, um, discipline, so that at the end of the day, I would win in the future. You see, I would, I would endure pressure. I would endure denial. Uh, it might be food. It might be time spent more social, whatever. I would, I would endure those things. I would endure tough discipline because I want the crown, because I want to end the race. It is outweighed by the hope of winning. So the pressure, that doesn't mean anything. The denial, the, the tough discipline, that does not, it doesn't matter because I've got a hope in winning. I, I wish that we could have lived this way in our Christian look to the big prize, and that is heaven, and the real uncorruptible crown at the end of the day. Let's look at the miracle of memory. You know, each little brain cell is a master computer. Unbelievable. We cannot comprehend the, the enormity of this. It is responsible for coordinating millions of little stimuli that we are bombarded with on a second-to-second -second basis. All the time we are stimulated. The understanding memory is rapidly becoming more understood. Every day there's more research. There's every day more things that show us, well, this is the root. This is... This is what happens. Let's explore the habit a little bit. You see, when it comes to memory, if an act is repeated, the brain will start growing new little shortcut connections. This is what they call the white matter in the brain. It is this neurotransmitters, and they all connect it. Not physically, but there's a little synapse space between them and the ones here, the ones there, the ones there, and they form a whole bundle. If I do this action once, another little strand is added, another strand is added, it's neurotransmitters that's added, added, and it becomes a white mass. And soon there will be a direct line between all the brain cells used. Let me, let me explain this practically. My father-in-law was a smoker for many years, and then... He stopped, but uh, he went to a barbecue with friends, and somebody offered him a cigarette, and he thought, man, I'll just take a path or two, you know, just to be social, and there he started smoking again. And then they came to visit us, and he, he got some flack from my son that was a small boy of four or five years old, and he didn't want to sit on his lap, and he said, no, I'm not going to sit with you, Opa, you stink. I'm not going to sit with you. And Opa made a cognitive decision. I want to stop smoking. And so we helped Opa to stop smoking. And it went difficult and he got over this whole problem. But five years later, when we visited them in their town on a, on a holiday, uh, in the holiday season, Christmas time, after Christmas lunch, we uh, went up to the, to the television room and we sit there and he takes his remote and he selects a channel and then I see him doing something very interesting. He does this. And I look at him and I said, Dad, what's happening? And he blushes a bit and he says, Man, this is interesting. Remember, he didn't smoke for five years. He smoked for many years before that. And he did this after lunch. He looked for his cigarettes. He would put it in his mouth. He would light it up and he would smoke. Now he didn't for smoke for five years. I want you to know that he built little strands over many years. You see, he didn't think to himself, okay, it is now five past five, I need to smoke. No, there was a pattern that was followed many years. And this pattern is really relayed in this neurotransmitters right there, positioned to do A to Z, not even thinking about it. I said to him, Dad, what do you think would have happened if you had a packet of cigarettes in your pocket? And he said, well, I suppose I, sh I, I would have put it in my mouth. I said, do you think you, you would have liked it? He said, you know, I think if I had a, a light in my pocket, I would have liked This is really what we're trying to explain to you. You see, everything that happens to you second by second is recorded in your brain in the form of these little connections. Your brain records everything in picture format. I want you to imagine something. 
I've got a lemon here on this, uh, on this table. And I want to tell you, uh, well, I want to demonstrate something that happens with, with this lemon. I'm going to take this lemon. And um, this is a lemon. You, you can see this is a lemon. Now, um, I know if I had my audience right in front of me, and I know that's what's happening where you are looking at, there's some pools in your face. Now, this was quite a tough little scheme to bite through. But uh, I know that where you are looking, there was the sensation of something pulling up here in your, in your jaw. And that's because of the sourness of a lemon. Now, this is how powerful our brains are. You see, I, you didn't taste the lemon, did you? No, you didn't bite the lemon. I bit the lemon. But you tasted when I, and I can imagine where you are, you actually taste the lemon right now. You can, you, can, you can taste that sensation, that bitterness, but also that lemoniness. You, I, 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 I know that that is happening. I've tested this so many times. This is how, how really powerful our brain is. It is in these stands where habits and memories are rooted. Science shows that every time we repeat a habit, another strand of white is added in exactly the right memory spots. And it's forming a new, and it forms cables at the end of the day. And you can look at the brain, you can see these thicker, whiter areas. That is habit. It could be whatever habit. It could be something like, you know, a good habit uh, or a bad habit. Our habits are also recorded in these little networks. All the time it's recorded in these networks. Every time we repeat a habit, another piece of white is added to the network. And it becomes bigger and thicker the more we do it. That could be something like somebody smoking where we've got that circle around. Um, it could be somebody that's got um, negative thoughts. These habits can be good or it could be bad. Now look at negative thoughts. They're always thinking negative. You know, uh, when somebody says something, I, I'm negative. No, it's not going to work. Let's try this. No, it's not going to work. You actually form another strand, another strand every time you are negative and you become a negative person. It becomes your habit. It's a bad habit. And it actually has an impact on your character because you are now seen characterized as a negative person, a grumpy old man. Now, there's some memory enhancing that we could do, and I need to just share with you as we uh, you know, end the, the series, and we, we're close to ending the series, memory enhancing could be done by exercising your brain, by repetition. So you repeat things. I, one, one of my medical friend doctors he says, you know, when I wrote my exams, I had to repeat things at least six times. I studied the same thing six times. Determine your dominant brain function. It could be a left brain or a right brain thinker. I'm not saying, you know, if you're left brain, focus on left. If you're right brain, focus. You know what? I see people that are really cognitively going ahead. They are using and trying to use and utilize both their functional heads. Not just the right brain, not just the left but try and use both of them. That's really good. Habits, good or bad? Should you choose to change your approach to how you think about life? Start becoming positive. And what's going to happen is, every time something negative happens, I think positive about it. And so I build another strand positive. And very, very soon, that will be your dominant action. You would, you would the positiveness would dominate the negative past old man that there was and uh, this kindness I can do this to being kind every time you know I, I may be a bit unkind but be kind every time and the more you would do this you would actually build uh, a new register in your brain that would change really who you are if you repeat the positive choice 23 times and a new habit becomes then a dominant one I want to share this statement with you it's found in Messages young to Young People, page 407. The enemy of righteousness has every kind of pleasure prepared 
for youth in all conditions of life. And they are not presented alone in crowded cities, but in every spot inhabited by the human beings. Satan loves to secure the youth in his ranks as soldiers. The arch friend well knows with what material he has to deal. And he has displayed his infernal wisdom in devising customs and pleasures for the youth which will separate their affections from Jesus Christ. I want to share a thought with you in closing. Somewhere in your brain, I've got an idea where that is, using the mind, God communicates with us. He communicates with me. He communicates with you. He wants to restore the original Eden mind in you. He wants to restore it in me. He came to this world in the person of his son in order to set up a rescue mission to save us. Because, you know, I am lost. But he set up something to save me. He planned success for me long term. We are saved. But not that we might sit back and indulge ourselves in the thought, the Lord has saved me. I'm okay. I want to share Romans 12 verse 2 with you. It says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In order to prove by you what is that is good and pleasing and the perfect will of God. The characteristics of a new mind is what we're going to discuss in our next episode. We're going to look at those things that would change your whole way of thinking. I want to ask you and leave you with this question. Do you want a new mind? May God help you to have the desire to have a new mind. And at the next session, the next episode, we're going to unpack this new mind so that God can do in us what he really wants to do through us. May God bless you until we meet again.